What's up, everybody? Andrew Mahone here with Tricky Jim at Full Grip Games. Going to be streaming our shop tournament tonight. We have got eight players, a lot of players out of town this weekend, traveling for the holidays and so on and so forth, spending time with family. But we do have eight players showed up for our standard Pokemon tournament tonight. So going to be streaming this little three-round tournament. And then when the stream is finished, who knows, might play some games on PTCGO as well. Get some stream time in tonight, so stoked on that. What's up, Zeely? Welcome to the chat. Our first round is getting set up now. We've got Jesse Parker versus Zach Pra. I have no idea what decks these guys are going to be showing off tonight, but excited to see where we end up in this standard Pokemon trading card game tournament at Full Grip Games. I just got back from the Anaheim Regional Championships, so i am got my mind full of Expanded right now. It is going to be a nice kind of break to get back to Standard format. I, for one, am very excited about Standard and find it to be a lot more fun to play than Expanded format. So I'm stoked on that, and I think this should be a nice kind of revisit to Standard for us. I know we got the new set coming out in uh, February. I think it's early February. The tag team set comes out. I'm stoked on that as well. I'm really excited to see what new cards bring to standard format. Thank you, M uh, Embriskia. Embriskia, thank you for the sub. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Awesome stuff there. Uh, still working on my partner status very close. Going to the Anaheim Regional Championships really kind of threw a wrench in all of that. But I do have to stream four more times. I'm going to try and stream four more times in the next like four days. See if I can just get those out the way real quick so I can get 12 stream days in the last 28 or so. Looks like Zach is playing Blacephalon on the left and then Jesse appears to be playing Malamar on the right. And I believe I see the Prism Star potentially on Jesse's side as well. So that should be pretty interesting to see how that affects the matchup. Zach starting out with a mulligan hand, going to give Jesse the early advantage there with an extra card. It should be uh, really nice to visit standard format again after seeing expanded format this past weekend. Turns just took so long at the Anaheim Regional Championships. I know some turns were taking like five to 10 minutes with battle compressor, trainer's mail, so much deck shuffling, so much different deck search options during your turn that you're just constantly shuffling and reshuffling and reshuffling, going into the deck, so on and so forth. So. I think that we might be going to the North Carolina Regional Championships. Still uh, still thinking about which regionals we're going to be going to for the rest of the year. Uh, hello, what's up? Thank you, MIW fan. Appreciate it. My birthday was fantastic. Had a great time at Disney. All right. Looks like Zach does have his basic starter there. Uh, the players shake hands, and they're going to go ahead and get started. We do see that Lunala Prism Star there on Jesse's side. And then Zach starting with his Marshadow. You know, that's definitely not where he wanted to be with his starter. Jesse's got a much more formidable start here with Lunala Prism Star in the active. I think he's got an Inke there on the bench. And then we'll use Tapu Lele's Wonder Tag probably to grab himself a draw supporter. I uh, think I see him eyeing up the Lily there, but I wonder if he can actually pare his hand down enough to make that a viable option. Could always go for the turn one Cynthia too. That is a possibility, but I am not the biggest fan of turn one Cynthia. I really do like to do Lily on the first turn so that your Cynthia's can be in the deck for later on during those turns where you're just trying to keep tempo and draw fresh hands throughout the course of the game. But Jesse's hand is pretty logged down with unplayable cards, so he's going to have to go in with that Cynthia there. We also see the unit energy in Jesse's hand, which kind of clues us into the fact that he might be playing Ultra Necrozma in this list as well. Looks like we've got a pretty unique list here from Jesse, probably just Malamar, Ultra Necrozma with unit energies and the Lunala Prism Star. 
Lots of different stuff going on there. I uh, got MIW fan asking how relevant is Vika Ray in today's standard meta? It's not, it's a little bit like falling by the wayside, unfortunately. Uh, I think that uh, Blacephalon more or less does the same thing that Vika Ray does, it just does it more consistently and has non GX attackers built in with the Naganadel. So Vika Ray is falling a little bit behind, especially with the popularity of Ninetales and Guardi. Uh, both hitting Rayquaza for weakness can be some, uh, some tough stuff there. Jesse, after the Cynthia, gonna go in with another Mysterious Treasure and grab a second Inke make his board very solid here after the first turn. Thank you all for showing up. Welcome to the stream tonight. Appreciate it, thank you. Thank you for the bits, Oxelasan. Appreciate it, appreciate it very much. Got a question in the chat. Does Buzzwell beat Blacephalon? Uh, unfortunately, Buzzwell is weak to Psychic and Blacephalon can attack with those Naganadels, making a pretty tough matchup. So Jesse got a very formidable start here, but Zach does start with Ultra Ball for double fire. That is a very strong play on his side. Definitely love to see fire energy accelerated to the discard pile early as a Blacephalon player. Unfortunately though, I don't think Zach will be able to get that Blacephalon into the active position here in order to burst GX for his first prize. That's usually a kind of uh, ideal play for a Blacephalon deck, taking that first prize with the Burst GX as early as the first turn. But unfortunately, many of these lists are not playing any switch outs. So that Marshadow will be stuck there until it gets manually retreated or until Zach Guzma's around it. So he does have the Guzma in hand, I think, but that's not the play he wants to make. He needs to establish his board. He needs to draw more cards with that Lily for sure in order to get some Poiples on the bench. And we see him decide to go for the Lily. I like this play a lot. Looking for some Poiples or an Ultra Space or something, Ultra Ball, Mysterious Treasure, anything to help set up his board. But I think he's just got the one Poiple and is going to have to pass it to Jesse. That's all he could do on the first turn here. So Jesse, very happy with this uh, turn one from Zach, very underwhelming. Uh, he's got multiple, you know, Inke out. He's got the Malamar already hitting the bench and a Cynthia. That Lunala Prism Star can help charge up his Pokemon in play as well. The Malamars do the same thing, but the Lunala does have 160 hit points and is just a big wall there in the active position. Zach does not want to have to loss zone four energy in order to knock out the Lunala Prism Star. That would be a huge waste. Oh, what's up, Calamari boy? How you doing? Welcome to the chat. I always read the comments, guys. You know that. You know that. It is, uh, I do need to focus on the game, though, but I do like to check in, and I'm going to be doing some PT PTCGO streaming here uh, for the remainder of the week and into the weekend. Going to be doing some more PTCGO streams, getting back into the swing of things after being away for some time at the uh, Anaheim Regional Championship. So uh, we could look forward to that. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys all tune in for that. Really much appreciate it. Jesse going in with an Ultra Ball, gotten two Psychics in the discard pile. That's huge for him because he's going to be able to Psychic recharge those. But unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have a real uh, sustainable attacker on board right now. He's just got the setup. He could attack with a Tapu Lele, but that's definitely suboptimal. He wants to attack with a non-GX attacker into that uh, into that Mars Shadow. He does not want to take that knockout with a Pokemon GX because that just opens the doors for Zack to punish him. So I think that, yeah, Jesse is not even going to Psychic Recharge. He is just going to power up the Lunala Prism Star in the active. And I really like that play from Jesse, choosing to accelerate with Lunala's first attack rather than Psychic Recharge because he doesn't have any great targets for Psychic Recharge. What's up? We got Otto and Riley in the chat. Thank you guys for stopping by. Natalie in the chat as well. Thank you guys so much for popping in and saying, hey, appreciate it. 
Uh, Zach is eyeing up his hand right now. He's got a second energy on the Blacephalon and a Naga Nadal. Um, wondering if he has a Guzma available. I think he does since he lilied. He's going to opt to do the Guzma. So I'd be interested to see if Zach actually attacks with this thing with mind blown or if he just decides to gx i think i like the gx move better just in case jesse doesn't have an easy way to retreat the malamar that way he also keeps his energy in play as well that being said i think the lunala prism star uh could punish that blacephalon if he finds a way to retreat the malamar so Oh, it looks like he will go for the Mind Blown. I think the Burst GX might have been the optimal play there. But this Lunala Prism Star is looking hungry. Could take advantage of this opportunity to knock out a Pokemon GX. Jesse would need a lot of energy in play in order to pull that off. But it might be possible. I'm actually... Uh, unfamiliar, what does the Lunala Prism Star, I'm going to look it up, Lunala, this isn't a car you'd see every day, Prism Star, I know it does more energy times the amount, uh, or more damage times the amount of energy that is in play, let's see, that first attack is Full Moon Star, for each of your opponent's Pokemon in play, uh, attached to Psychic Energy, that's the first attack. The second attack is Psy Storm. This attack does 20 damage times the amount of energy attached to all Pokemon. It's probably why Zack went for the Mind Blown there to decrease the amount of energy that was in play. So I guess I see that there does attack Jesse's board position a little bit by eliminating a Malamar. That being said, uh, it might be tough to kind of respond from here. I think what Zach was going for is he wants to knock out the Malamar, then soak a hit from this Lunala this turn without getting KO'd, which he should be able to do since he did remove those energy from play, and then uh, go for the Burst GX next turn while he probably lays some more Poiples and Naganadels on the board next turn, or some more Poiples in, uh, in search of a Naganadel on the following turn. Oh, thank you, Natalie, for the bits. Much appreciated. So I'm actually okay with Zach's board right now. I think it's fine so long as he has a more explosive turn next turn and benches some more things. We definitely need to see a couple, a couple more poiples on Zach's side in order to make his board more sustainable here going forward. Jesse has got the Dawn Wings out. He could, oh, we're going to see a GX attack from Jesse. This is wild, ultimately punishing him for taking that prize. Insane, retreats the Lunala Prism Star, Psychic recharges twice onto the Dawn Wings, attaches for turn, and is going to take this knockout. Jesse is taking a huge lead here, knocking out that, uh, <laughs> that Blacephalon GX, and Zach is on the back foot. He does have Beast Ring in hand as well as a Blacephalon, so he's going to be able to respond with some energy. But his board is just not very strong right now with only one Naganadel in play. Thank you, uh, Nebulane, Nebulanine, Nebul Nebula 9. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Nebula 9, for the bits. Appreciate it. I do plan on going to Collinsville. Uh, and then potentially also Madison, both of them. So thank you very much for the bits. Much appreciated. Zach does rip that first beast ring there, eyeing up the second one. Probably has to play that onto his Naganadel on the bench just so that he has the option to do some damage. But unless he's got Guzma in hand, he's not going to be able to get around the barrier from that uh, from that Dawn Wings GX. So Zach may just have to leave the Marshadow in the active this turn, but we do see him throw all four energy onto that Blacephalon. This is wild. He is really going all in, all five energy. I wonder if he has a Guzma here to get around. We do see the charge up coming out of the discard pile on that Naganadel. His Cynthia does have Guzma. He's going to go for the Lele. 
Wow, Zach just has it all in his hand this turn, and it's going to send all four of those energies to the Lost Zone. Incredible turn from Zach. Looked like he was really on the ropes there and was able to just get around that Dawn Wings completely. This is a nutty game so far. Completely insane from both sides, just really teeing off, taking huge knockouts back to back. Now we got to ask ourselves, can Jesse respond to this quick aggression from Zach. If Jesse can respond with a knockout here, it's going to be game over for Zach. There's no way he's coming back without B-string. But if Zach can stabilize after this turn, maybe burst GX and then take out a GX on the following turn, then it's going to be a wrap and Zach will be able to find his route to victory there. We do see Jesse just go for the Guzma stand-in and he's going to knock out the Naganade on Zach's bench. That means he's got another turn of potential B strings. And I really like this opportunity for Zach. If he can just find some more B strings, he doesn't even need Naganadel in play. He just needs to draw as many cards as he can and potentially see some more B strings here. He can even B string to Poiples. He just needs to get three more energy in play, one B string, one manual attachment, and he can go in and knock out that uh, Ultra Necrozma here. So uh, we see a Cynthia from Zach. He got the Poipo there off of the search option, and he's gonna shuffle up and draw six cards. If Zach doesn't rip it here, he can opt for the Burst GX. It's not bad. Sets him down to two prizes remaining, and Jesse still hasn't seen an Ultra Necrozma yet. May just be because he was choosing to Guzma last turn and didn't play a draw card in order to maybe go find an Ultra Necrozma, or he might have prized them. I'm not exactly sure yet. So let's see, Zach's gonna draw his six, and what does he get? Does he find another beast ring and an energy to attach from hand? I don't immediately see the beast ring there on Zach's side, but that's fine. If he's got a Poipal at the very least, might be able to make it happen, or a Blacephalon. He definitely needs to slam more Pokemon down to protect his side of the field. I think he does have an attachment for turn that he has to use, though, so he does have to throw... I think I would like to see him throw an energy down, unless he has already, and I don't think he has. So that energy attachment from hand would have been good just to help keep the pace up there for his attachments. I believe that energy was already there on the Blacephalon. So that is, uh, it's a little bit confusing. I'm not sure why he didn't attach return, unless I missed the attachment for return already before the Cynthia, but I'm pretty sure there was not one. Welcome to the stream, guys. Thank you all for hanging out with us tonight here at Full Grip Games. Much appreciated. We see Jesse definitely go get that Ultra Necrozma GX. Gonna be looking for that thing to take a big knockout and punish that Blacephalon looming in the active position there. If Jesse can take this big one hit KO, it's gonna be game over for Zach. There's no way he's gonna be able to respond and take two more prizes after this thing goes out. I think that Jesse might not have the energy in the discard pile that he needs. We see him scan the discard now, can't quite see how many are there though. He does have the unit energy for that Ultra Necrozma. He's got the retreat as well to send the two. If he has a switch in hand, it's game over. There's no way Zach will be able to come back from this. Does he have the switch? Yes, he does. He's got the whole combo. Insanity. And this thing is a goner. He's got that huge attack there. And he's got Cynthia. He had the whole combo before the Cynthia, that is absolutely wild. Amazing stuff there from Jesse. Going to take this game by storm here. Zach is going to have to just promote the Poiple with the one fire energy, and that's all he has. There's no way he's going to be able to take two prizes with one Poiple in play and B-string out of the question. So Jesse is running away with this one here. We've seen the benefits of that unit energy as well because he used the unit energy once on the Dawn Wings, now using it on the Ultra Necrozma here. So pretty excited to see that unit energy paying dividends for him also. 
rips the acro bike, taking a look at his hand. What does he want to keep? What's he want to get rid of? At this point, Jesse is very much in cruise control and in control of this matchup here. Uh, he only has to take one more prize. Going to be able to do that with ease with the Don Wings on his bench, just being able to invasion and knock out whatever non-GX. Zach might leave in the active position. If he leaves a GX in the active position, then if Jesse has a uh, switch, it's probably game over. I guess there is a route where Jesse isn't able to knock out an active Blacephalon. If Zach is able to throw a Blacephalon into the active position this turn and uh, Bursting Burn the Necrozma, there is the possibility that Jesse couldn't take that knockout. But if Zach can't make that happen off of the Sof Sophocles, then it is going to be game here. A quick game, huge knockouts on both sides. We do see Zach play the Heat Factory, finally got that thing out. So he's going to be able to see three more cards here off of the Heat Factory if he decides to discard a Fire Energy. But he's got to get himself that Blacephalon, like I said. Goes for the charge up. He's got the Fire in hand. Let's see that Heat Factory. Just see if you can get anything. He does have the Ultra Ball, so he can actually go get himself a Blacephalon to just retreat into. Uh, that's what he has to do. Uh, but if Jesse just has a Guzma, it's going to be game over. I mean, Jesse can easily take out that Marshadow on Zach's bench, but you have to play to your outs at this point and just hope that maybe your opponent doesn't have it. I mean, it does require uh, a couple of cards. Jesse does need some cards in his hand in order to take game here. It's not a guarantee. It's not on board. So Zach has to just sit here and hope that maybe he doesn't. Zach does have an attachment from turn. I think he needs to attach to that Blacephalon, retreat into it, and just pass. That's all he can do. There's nothing more. He's got a Lily in hand. He will be able to draw more cards next turn if Jesse doesn't have it. But we see him kind of turning the cogs here, just making sure that there's nothing else he could do to solidify his board position even more. But I don't think there is. This is just where he's at, where he's got to be comfortable, just passing and saying, well, I hope you don't got it like that, my guy. That's just uh, that's just it. And you hate to be in this position, but it is just a position you find yourself in quite often in Pokemon. But sometimes it ends up buffing out for you. Uh, we do see Zach go in for a second Mysterious Treasure, probably just trying to get himself another Poiple just so it's easier to take the game-winning play next turn. If Jesse, by some miracle, doesn't have it, but we do see Jesse just chilling there with his hand down, making me think that Jesse is probably pretty confident in the fact that he has game. A situation like this is where Zach just really wishes that he had that Marshadow as an available option to limit Jesse's hands to four cards. We do see Jesse kind of moving a card to the front of his hand there, making me think that he's kind of ready to go. <laughs> he probably has it. We do see the Bursting Burn. I like that play from Zach, but I think that the game's about to be over here. Uh, he is showing him the switch. Yeah, I think that switch is going to be it. Uh, if he switches into, I guess, doesn't quite have it. He still needs an attachment from hand if he switches because he needs one more energy to retreat off of any of those attackers down there. So the switch will get him halfway there. He also needs an energy in his hand in order to take it. The Bursting Burn goes into effect. Does Jesse have the energy in hand to combo with that switch? Yes, he does. So he should just have game here. Should be able to switch into the Inke Double Psychic Recharge to the Ultra Necrozma, retreat the NK, and blow that Blacephalon up for game. That should just be it. We see Jesse kind of count some things out, but he does have it. I uh, just got to go for, oh, what do we see here? Is he going to do it with the, <laughs> with the Lunala Prism Star instead? I guess he could have had that uh, a different way, but wanted to get there with the Lunala. So we're seeing that Lunala Prism Star stunting on the Blacephalon. Let's see, is this a knockout? Is this game? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 19 with the Choice Band. 190 damage. Got there. Jesse Parker with the dub showing off the Lunala Prism Star there for game 
Awesome stuff. Jesse was able to take that game for Storm. Awesome play there mid-game with the uh, Dawn Wings Necrozma GX as well. So awesome stuff there. Uh, great game between Jesse and Zach. Two big decks. And I've seen a lot more of this matchup lately than I had in the past. A lot of Necrozma versus Blacephalon. Two decks that are really similar in essence. They both play Ultra Beast Pokemon. They both can play Beast Rings as well. They both play Stage 1 that accelerate energy from the discard pile. They both play Psychic Stage 1s that accelerate energy from the discard pile. So they're extremely similar decks in essence. And a lot of times the Blacephalon versus Ultra Necrozma match can feel like a mirror match, even though it is not quite a mirror match. So thank you to everybody who showed up in the chat to check out the tournament tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Natalie and Otto, for hanging out and helping to moderate the chat as well. Uh, everybody who subbed to Tricky Jim here on Twitch, uh, Natalie helped me out today to go get Discord all set up for the Twitch subs. So that's awesome as well. Shout out to Natalie for getting that all hooked up. That has been awesome. Uh, the Twitch or the Discord chat is for the Patreon subs and the Twitch subs. And Natalie and I hang out in there all the time. We talk about Pokemon cards. I share all my deck lists in there as well. Any deck lists that I have that I'm working on, any deck list before a tournament, all goes to the Discord chat. There's no secrets there. That is just everything straight from the source. Uh, tell you guys what decks I'm working on at any given point in time in there. So that is the place to be if you are looking for uh, the deck list that I am working on at any given point. So awesome stuff there. Thank you, Natalie, again, for setting that all up. Uh, working on getting the partner status uh, again. I got a couple emotes that I have in mind that I am going to be working on. Also, have got an amazing, uh, an amazing animation. What's up, Sean? Huh? Do you want the winners? Do I want the winners? If there's time, yeah. Uh, if no. there's, I'll see. yeah, yeah. If there's time, then bring them back. If there's not time, then okay. you know, just move on to the next round and give me a pairing. But yeah, if there's time and Jesse wants to come back and talk on camera, he's welcome to. So. Got a bunch of uh, emotes that I want to work on. Got an amazing animation as well that uh, somebody's been helping me out with on Twitter. They have been messaging me, so I'm trying to get that animation up for the uh, you know for when people sub and all that going on. It's been uh, amazing. So that's really cool. Stoked on that as well. And. Uh, Let's see, what else I got going on? Yes, on YouTube, the art contest video. So I hosted an art contest, $100 to the grand prize winner. That's going to be going up on YouTube tomorrow morning at 8.30 Eastern time. So stoked on that, stoked to announce the winner to the art contest that I was hosting. That was just so much fun. Had an amazing time doing that art contest. Got so many amazing submissions. Got like 30 submissions. Some of them are absolutely insane like I cannot believe that some of you guys are just that talented so that was amazing to see as well how many talented people we got out there who submitted things to the Tricky Gym art contest so excited to show off the grand prize winner tomorrow morning on Tricky Gym's YouTube channel 830 like I said Alrighty, I recognize this sweatshirt anywhere we got Matt Price coming up here on to the stream tables at uh, Matt Price, a Full Grip Games employee and one of my best friends. All right. I probably figured out who's on who. That's Matt today. Price, yeah. And then who else is playing? Brady Botner. Brady Botner. All right. We've got a battle of the hometown heroes here. Oh, look at you. You're adding stuff in here. I know. Look at me. Oh, Natalie, my. you guys will notice Natalie was a huge help today. She helped me figure out how to edit the overlays here on OBS without completely re-editing the entire thing in uh, Photoshop. So that was insane. This has been huge. Uh, see, so let's see who, Brady Botner, yep, Brady Botner. Brady is playing Blacephalon, I know that. What's up? But you didn't know how to do that. No, this has been so oh, easy. Oh, it's so it's so easy now. It's, it's when you want to make a new player card and have like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so easy. Okay. This is great. 
and Matt Price is going to be showing off a Passimian deck. So stoked to see how his Passimian deck performs here against the Blacephalon Machine, the meta mainstay. Uh, I was getting some flack from Matt Price for calling Passimian a bad deck. I was... <laughs> was calling Pacific a bad deck. One of our employees here, uh, Julian, was looking to get into the Pokemon trading card game and was considering building his first deck. And Matt told him to build Pacific. I told him that I didn't think Pacific was all that good. And then Matt's like, what do you mean it's not good? Everybody's playing Pacific. It's really good now. It's even, you know, topping some tournaments. Uh, apparently, it, it topped that tournament that was held. Uh, I guess, where was it held? There was a tournament in, like, Europe or something. That was held over the course of last weekend with uh, the same weekend as Anaheim. So Matt is going to be showing off Passimian and hopefully proving me wrong here to show me that Passimian is a very good deck. So awesome stuff here. Both players 1-0. Brady's a player you will recognize. He's always up here doing well with his Blacephalon deck or Lost March deck or something like that. Brady has been doing really well at our locals here, winning a ton of store credit in the last uh, last few weeks. So awesome to see Brady again at 1-0. Yes, it was Harrogate. That's the uh, tournament I'm thinking about was in England, right? So awesome stuff there. Passimian is a relevant deck right now. So great to see Matt kind of uh, right there with the meta trends with this Passimian deck so that we can all see it in action here at Full Grip Games here on Tricky Gym. Awesome stuff. Players are cutting up. See if they get any basic Pokemon here in their starting hands. Matt was showing me his Passimian list before tonight's tournament and was showing off that new Victini. Apparently the new Victini is all the rage in this deck. You can play it with counter energy. I think it does more damage for the amount of basic Pokemon you have on your bench. It's like 20 damage times the amount of basic Pokemon either on your bench or in play. Still got to figure that out but the victini i think it's v beatdown is the name of the attack very cool uh let's see victini lost thunder i'm gonna look it up and see what the deal is with this card uh so i'm not just talking all sorts of crazy why are all these in japanese okay here we go uh v beatdown for a fire and a colorless attack does 20 damage for each of your basic pokemon in play so that means it can do 120 damage since every pokemon in the Passimian deck is basic, right? So that's awesome with a counter energy. You can do 120 damage, 150 with the choice band, and then with the Shrine of Punishment damage over time, it's easily enough to take some one-hit KOs on relevant Pokemon GX. We see Matt start with an explosive start here, getting two Passimians out, double Nest Ball, Tapu Koko in the active position there. So that is a great start there for Matt. I was trying to tell Matt to put a Passimian, or not a Passimian, to put a Orangaroo, the other monkey, to put an Orangaroo in this deck before uh, today's tournament. He was not super high on Orangaroo. I told Matt that you need Orangaroo because this deck doesn't have Tapu Lele. So you want to be able to continue to turn through your deck even when you're kind of on the ropes, not really drawing too hot. Looks like he might have the Orangaroo in his hand. He's shuffling his hand around pretty quick here. Can't quite see but a double colorless energy on the active. And look at that. I told Matt to put that Orangaroo in there, and here it is drawing him cards. I am so excited. All right. So that is awesome. That hand would have been dead, just McDead without that Orangaroo. Instead, he's got double acro bike action off of here and continuing to just jam through his deck here. I love the Instruct Orangaroo in this Passimian list, just allowing you to just tee off and draw a ton of cards uh, throughout the course of your turn. Awesome stuff here. So Matt's starting off extremely explosively. That double colorless energy on the Tapu Koko means he's going to be softening up a ton of Blacephalons early. And I love that about this deck, that you could just start with this free retreater, Tapu Koko, soften up a ton of Pokemon, 
Uh, flying flip in tandem with Shrine of Punishment just completely demolishes an opponent's board position, allowing for some huge sweep up action with Basimian later in the game. And I think Blacephalon's popularity has really helped to improve Passimian's place in the metagame because Blacephalon is just a big Pokemon GX. Passimian really takes advantage of that, knocks it out very easily. Yes, Naga Nadal can trade with Passimian, but a lot of times the Naganadels in a Blacephalon deck, you're only playing like a 3-3 line. If you are playing a 4-4 line, you're probably not playing a Rescue Stretcher, meaning that you're only going to be able to attack with Naganadel so many times, while Passimian just easily takes care of the Naganadels one by one with the Passimian. It's very easy for them to take that knockout. Uh, additionally, if Brady does ever have to go in with the Blacephalon GX, it'll easily get torn up by these Passimian as well. So it could get kind of hectic out here for Brady, especially since Brady is not going to be able to burst GX on the first turn of the game. Instead, he started a Puipul. So already looking a little tough out here for Brady, but we do see Brady go ahead and establish his board with a bunch of Puipuls. The Beast Energy making its way onto the Puipul and a Let Loose. Beast Energy on the Puipul looking crazy out here. Gonna be uh, performing a very strong eye opener. I think that's probably the Poipul that he's playing. Let's see, Poipul. Uh, just checking my artwork real quick, make sure that is the eye opener Poipul card. But yeah, that would be uh, that would be pretty funny to see that performed there. This is, yes, the eye opener one. So he could take a look at his prize cards with a very strong Poipul. However, uh, that beast energy could be very relevant if the Poipul does not get knocked out this turn. Because if the Poipul does not get knocked out, Brady will be able to evolve into Naganadal and take a one hit knockout on that Tapu Koko with his uh, with his turning point attack. So really like that option there that Brady has giving himself. If Matt does go in with the flying flip, then Brady can take a one hit knockout on the Tapu Koko. Taking knockouts on Tapu Koko and Passimian is going to be a huge pain for Brady to do because if he does have to mind blown any of these Passimians, loss zoning three energy for a non-GX is just not where you want to be at all. So suboptimal kind of matchup here for Brady. But again, Blacephalon is just such a strong deck that he might be able to make the best of it. Brady is establishing his board really well. I like the fact that he's just got all his Poiples out here. Uh, we see, let's see, Brady is taking a look at his prizes uh, one by one here. Eye opener, just getting to take a peek there, two by two at his prize cards. Use an eye opener. For a second, I was like, oh no, why is Brady taking prizes? And then realize just eye opener. So just using that opportunity there to look at all his prizes, gets to keep them in order, does not say to shuffle his prizes afterwards. So gets to keep them in order and hopefully he'll remember where his prizes are when he goes to start taking them on his next turn. Should be Matt's turn now. We see him kind of looking through his hand. He's got an escape board in his hand, uh, at least one and potentially an energy. Looks like a counter energy, maybe, but he is flashing that hand around very quick, so it's hard to tell. Matt doesn't really love the flying flip turn here. It's not exactly where he wants to be. I think he would rather take care of this Poiple that could turn into a Naganadel. He wants to get this thing out of here as quickly as possible, and there aren't any GXs on Brady's side to soften up. So without any GXs to soften up, he doesn't really feel like he needs to flying flip. I think Matt would much rather go in with Passimian, but I don't think he's got a draw card in his hand. He's just got counter catcher and counter energy. So I think he has to attach this counter energy and instruct for two. 
Uh, if Matt, or instruct for one, if Matt comes back and watches this later, I want him to just be very aware of how good the Oranguru has been so far. <laughs> I am very excited that he put the Oranguru into this list. It has been uh, an absolute wonder so far. The deck would not have been drawing anything without Oranguru. So no supporter there for Matt, but he still has a commanding board position. As soon as Brady does take a prize, Matt can countercatcher and kind of set up, tee off, do whatever he needs to do do but i do i am a little bit concerned that he put the uh put the counter energy on the orangaroo so interested to see why he ended up going for the counter energy there i would think that maybe i mean i guess the naginato can get knocked out by orangaroo but you don't really want to have orangaroo in the discard pile either because it's the only draw power that he has right now on his board so Interesting to see there. Yes, uh, I agree, Natalie. I'm with you on that one. So we are seeing Brady continue to set up his board. He's got three Naganadels out, setting up consistent as ever. So he is uh, very much in cruise control here, just uh, cruising through this hand, shuffling up his deck, got a whole board set up. I think Brady, at least in the weeks previously, has only been playing a 3-3 Naganadel line. If that's still the case with his current list, then these are all of his Naganadels, all out here to play right now. And that means that he may uh, or may not have a Rescue Stretcher option available. I'm not sure if he does play Rescue Stretcher. Does get a big Lily here for five cards, though, so that is awesome. He's got his board all set up. There's nothing more that he needs. Uh, really, if I'm Brady here, I just want to try and find a Rescue Stretcher if I play one, just in case this Naganadel does bite the dust. You can Rescue Stretcher, throw them back in, and then Ultra Space immediately for the Poiple afterwards. So there's nothing else that Brady really needs to do. He's really ready to go. Matt does need some things here, though. He's got the Shrine of Punishment, so that's good. I think he's got double counter catcher in his hand, and you hate to kind of burn those, but I think he might just need to in order to draw more cards. I do see the double colorless energy there. So team play should take a knockout. I think it does 30 more for each Passimian on your bench, and then we also... Uh, oh, he promoted the... Oh, it's got an escape board on it. Okay, so he can retreat the other one. I was going to say, he promoted the one with the ability there first. If I'm Matt, I think I like just double counter catcher. Get rid of those things. You're not going to need to counter catcher later in the game. You got Guzma, right? So you can just Guzma later in the game. Get rid of those counter catchers and draw some more cards. Establish your board a little bit more. Uh, oh, it's a judge. It's not double counter catcher. Okay, so... Didn't really see that there. He's going to drop the judge. Easy play from Matt there. Uh, limit Brady's hand, especially after he'd taken the prize, knowing that he's got just a nice, thick hand there. Limit him down to four cards. It's awesome that Matt does play a judge. Not a lot of decks are playing judge anymore. It's a, de it's a card that you see less and less in competitive lists, as many lists opt for a single Mars Shadow instead to limit their opponent's hands. So... Matt will go for the judge. Got a hand with four new cards. We do see a shrine in that hand, which is not exactly what you want to have. But Matt is going in with that Oranguru to take the knockout. So this could be big. Matt, I like the Oranguru play here now that I'm kind of seeing it because Brady has not prepared his board to knock out the Oranguru. The Oranguru has 120 hit points. So Matt is saying, you know what? guess you'll have to knock out this Oranguru. You'll have to put a Blacephalon in play if you want to take a prize this turn. So I really love that aggressive play from Matt here. That is super heads up, uh, you know, with the counter energy and the double colorless energy. And even when he gets ahead on prizes, he'll be able to utilize that attack still because the counter energy will still count as a single colorless energy. So very cool kind of checkmate play here from Matt. We'll see what Brady does to account for it. I mean, Brady could potentially take the knockout on that Oranguru if he were to bench a Blacephalon and energy switch to it. Uh, or I guess, can he knock it out with Tapu Lele if he were to attach an energy switch? I don't think so. Two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. He could only do 100 damage with Tapu Lele. It's not going to be enough anyway so 
Tough stuff there for Brady. Looks like he might be stuck while Matt has got him checked. Great play there for Matt Price. Matt Price is a uh, kind of a, a local tournament hero, also a regional finalist in his own right, but he does often boast that he wins League Cups like nobody's business. So he, <laughs> he is the best League Cup player I've ever seen. I think he won more League Cups last year than I have won in my entire career. So Matt Price is very much a local local hero in the Pokemon trading card game and one of Full Grip Games' own employees. So awesome stuff here from Matt. Let's see, Brady's got a fresh hand of six and is looking for a way out of this, but I think he might just be stuck. We do see him charge up to the bench Naganadel, and Brady is going to retreat. Uh, and then charge up back to that Naganado and just retreat into the Marsh Shadow. Uh, Matt gestures to the Shrine damage going on to the Tapu Lele and is feeling pretty good about this turn. Brady's going to have to Guzma around the Oranguru. There is just no way for him to easily dispatch this thing. So Matt has got him stuck. I love Matt's board position right now. Matt can also take a knockout on that Marsh Shadow since it did take 20 damage from the flying flip. So Matt is in a commanding position right here. Gonna take the lead going down to four prizes while Brady still has to figure out what to do about this Oranguru. The Oranguru could single-handedly take him out if he's not able to come up with the game plan quickly. I think right now Brady's just gonna rely on using Guzma and then maybe try to get down to a three prize turn to knock out the Oranguru. But that's not really where he wants to be either because he's sacking a turn of momentum in order to do that. But if Brady does have back-to-back -back Guzmas, I guess he would also have to like rescue stretcher a Naganadel back and start to set that up as well. So I'm not exactly sure if he can make it happen with this line of play. I think he might have needed, oh, it's just such a tough spot that Matt has got him in because the Nagan, or uh, the Blacephalon surely loses him the game. If he benches a Blacephalon, it's just game over. Those Pissimians there on the bench will gladly eat that thing alive. And the Naganadels just can't quite get there versus Oranguru. So Oranguru very much looking like the MVP here in this matchup let's see how brady opts to deal with it this turn i think that you know does he have to two hit ko this thing that surely is a game losing scenario as well if he does a two hit ko on another non gx is no bueno so brady eyeing up his hand over here he's got an energy switch potentially an ultra ball a lily it looks like uh, as well as uh, some other cards, but nothing that's really going to get him out of this mess, I don't think. Uh, I think he's just a little bit stuck. Brady will go for the Ultra Ball there. See him Ultra Balling away, a Lily and a Sightseer. Doesn't need those. Going to go get something else out his deck, and it might be Blacephalon time, but that's just, like, not good. Oh, he does have another Poiple, so that is very good. All right, he's got the Poiple. He's going to continue setting that up. I really like that. Uh, I really like setting up that other Poiple here. And the hopefully Brady just has a Guzma. I think that's what he's got to hope for this turn is to Guzma around, maybe knock out the Passimian uh, with the Choice Band, something like that. Uh, otherwise, he's going for a 2 at KO on the on the Oranguru, and that's definitely not what he wants. I think, you know, ideally, Brady might have uh, been able to put a, an energy onto his Tapu Lele last turn so that maybe he could energy switch and attach this turn and get three energy on the Tapu Lele in order to knock out the Oranguru. That's not ideal. I mean, you do trade two prizes for one, but I imagine that Brady will eventually get himself into that situation anyways where he does kind of trade negatively with this Oranguru. We see Matt uh, just promote the the Passimian here with the free retreat since it does have the escape board on it. 
Matt will opt to play Gladian this turn, take a look at those prizes, and select one that he wants to trade with Gladian. I played against a Gladian deck this past weekend as well at the Anaheim Regional Championships. There was a Sableye Garbodor deck that utilized Gladian very well uh, against me. That was a tough matchup for my Blastoise deck. So Gladian is a card that I have never played myself, but I have seen it played quite a bit by other people. Just not a card that I have ever committed to a list Usually, if there is a deck that relies on uh, cards as much that they would need to Gladian for it, I don't usually want to play it myself. But I will say that Passimian, even though all four of your Passimian are very valuable, Gladian is a nice resource for this deck. And Passimian is usually very consistent in its ability to uh, its ability to churn through its deck and take favorable prize trades with your opponent. Because even if you don't start off with four Passimian, you know, in the deck and you have maybe two prized, you can Gladian for one while you just flying flip. So it's an okay way to buy some time while you search out that Gladian and get the Passimians out of your prizes very easily. So let's see, Matt, uh, let's see, got an Acrobike there in the discard pile, eyeing up his hand, making sure there's nothing he'd rather do. But I think I just like a knockout on that active Naganadel. He's doing enough with the Rangaroo to take the knockout. I'm not sure that there's anything else that he really needs to do. I think he just takes the knockout and proceeds forward with this favorable matchup. Uh, no problems. But see Matt kind of eyeing things up, just thinking through his turn, making sure that there's nothing here that he's missing in his hand. And I do like that, just to make sure that, you know, he's not not kind of messing up in any sort of way. But I think the matchup's kind of in cruise control at this point. Should just be able to kind of lay some energy down and continue on with that Oranguru. Brady has still not cooked up a good response to this thing, so Oranguru Psychic will get in there and take the knockout. So awesome stuff, and uh, Matt will continue kind of forging his path forward. I think he's only got, is that only three or two prizes remaining? I can't quite see. I know he's ahead of Brady. Um, Brady's got to put that shrine damage on the Lele as well, so hopefully somebody remembers that. And uh, we don't uh, we don't forget about this. We do see Brady slap down that Blacephalon GX. That thing is going to end up taking some shrine damage as well, but I don't think Brady has any other way out of this one. I would go run to tell them to put the shrine damage. Looks like Matt did remember it himself, so that's good. We don't have a broken game state. Excellent. Very, very good. Uh, Brady's got an energy switch, but what more can he really do? He's going to charge up. Energy switch, got two energy on the Blacephalon. I uh, could retreat and charge up back and then blow this thing up. That feels horrible, but I think it's what he has to do. Sightseer's hand just to draw five cards. He had nothing to discard, so perfect Sightseer here for five. And I guess that's probably it. I don't think that Brady has any more options to get Naganadel. He does have Beast Ring, so that's really good. So he can accelerate more energies onto his Naganadel so they can take more prizes next turn, but you gotta imagine that this Blacephalon is probably going down, which is super stressful from Brady's side of the field. However, the Blacephalon taking a knockout here does mean that Brady will get to turning point for 160 damage next turn, meaning that he can knock out anything that Matt promotes. It shouldn't be a problem at all for uh, you know, for Brady to take his knockout next turn. My concern is that he's a little bit too far behind at this point and won't be able to overcome the unfavorable trades there early. That one turn where he had to sack the Marshadow was just really, really tough there for Brady. So let's see, what will Brady do? Will he knock out this Oranguru finally? I feel like he's got to, like it, it, just for <laughs> just for your own morale. You gotta take care of the Oranguru. That Oranguru is not gonna knock out my entire team, okay? So you gotta knock that thing out for sure. And leave the Blacephalon in the active with just one energy. Uh, Matt doesn't have knockout on the Blacephalon right now. It is a clean Blacephalon. It would take a lot to knock it out. I actually don't think the Passimian can get there by itself, but with the addition of the shrine damage here, might be enough if Matt is able to get that final Passimian in play. I believe team play, let's look up Passimian 
Passimian, all right. I don't want to misspeak, so I'm going to pull this card up here. Team play does 10 plus 30 damage for each of your benched Passimian. So that means that it can do 100 damage with three benched Passimian, 130 with a choice ban. So it is quite a ways off from a one-hit KO. This was a pretty ideal turn for Brady to put that Blacephalon into the active there. Shrine will add up eventually though. So the shrine damage will add up and uh, maybe eventually take that Blacephalon out, but Brady is kind of hoping that it is able to survive and also that Matt is not able to get himself that third Passimian. The third Passimian here is really going to do a ton of damage, but Matt also just has a counter energy on his Passimian right now. And since he's not actually down in prices, he needs another energy in order to attack. If Matt has to lose a turn here, then the ball is back in Brady's court for sure. He could double counter energy the Passimian. Uh, that is an option, but that's not something that you want to do either. Sacking two counter energies on the same Passimian is not good. I do see a double colorless energy in his hand though, so he's got the energy to attack. It's just, uh, he's got the rescue stretcher in his hand as well. So he knows he's not hitting for a one-hit knockout. He could hit for 130 damage with the shrines. He's going to be at 150. That means in three turns, the Passimian could, uh, the Blacephalon could be KO'd. We gotta imagine he's grabbing that Passimian here out of the discard pile. Love that as well. Good stuff. We should see that benched. And then Matt does need to commit another energy to this Passimian here to take a huge swing into that Blacephalon. Oh, actually, no, he's not. He's gonna just flying flip it. And I don't mind this at all. Flying flip on the Blacephalon is gonna soften it up and make it so that Matt can take a one hit KO next turn. I do like that. And also puts Brady in a weird position because if Brady just burst GXs, then uh, Matt will be able to come up and take a big knockout next turn turn and then Brady will just be on the unf unfavorable side of this trade. Matt has the game mapped out here on his side of the board. He just needs to take it and it's always awkward being uh, ahead on prizes in a counter energy deck having to do kind of you know reactive plays like this one and just force Brady into a corner so that there is just absolutely no escaping and I do like this play from Matt softening things up so that he could get the most mileage out of his Passimians before he has to, you know, try to retrieve them with rescue stretchers and things like that. He doesn't want the Passimian to get knocked out or anything like that. He wants to keep it safe on the bench for when it's going to take that big one hit knockout. So heads up play from Matt there. Brady does get the counter stadium though with that ultra space. So that is really nice for him and a little bit of a breath of fresh air so that he can stop taking that shrine damage turn after turn, really enjoying the ultra space here. And uh, it's gonna allow him to search his deck as well and continue setting up his board. But you know, what can he really do with three prizes left to take? Uh, he has to take three prizes. Uh, before Matt can win the game, and I don't think that he really can, unless there's something that I'm missing here. So long as Matt continues just attaching energy and swinging away, Brady's got a loss zone three fire energy, uh, just absolutely tough. And I do like that he took the three fire energy away from uh, the active Blacephalon. We gotta imagine that Blacephalon is probably going down this turn, right? Which would leave Matt at just one prize remaining. So if Matt does take this Blacephalon out, I think he can, since he is technically down in prizes right now. I think Matt is at three remaining. If he was at two, this would just be game. So must be at three. And then he's got to chalk up a way to take a final knockout. So he does want to make sure that he doesn't mess this up in any way. I think I don't mind like double counter energy on a single Passimian. 
I guess. Like, I don't know, you don't need to double counter. You just counter energy on both Passimians, like I said, so that you can go in, put a double counter energy onto a Passimian for game if you have to, because once Brady takes that one prize, they'll both be at one prize's remaining. And then Matt wants to have the option to attack in any way he can. And a double counter energy play could get him there. I'm not sure what his counter energy count is looking like. But I really love this play from Matt here, just opting to take out the Naganadel first so that the counter energy is live for game. If Matt can just find his other, uh, you know, find his other Guzma, then that means that he can counter energy for game to take his final two prizes. So I do really like that. I think Brady is kind of out of the game at this point. He could burst GX, but he knows that if he bursts GXs, that's just game over. So he's got to promote the Naganadel just so he doesn't lose the game. Because if he promotes any of the GX Pokemon, it's game over. Matt will easily take one of those out with team play on Passimian. So how does Brady plan on grinding his way out of this one? I guess he could try to strand, I think he has to strand something active. So he has to try and strand the other Passimian active, the one without the escape board. If he has a Guzma, you Guzma that one up, you try to GX and just hope that Matt doesn't have a switch or an energy card. That would be it, that's his only out. Uh, it does exist, it is possible for Brady to take the win here. He just has to Guzma, he has to have a Guzma, and he has to hope that Matt does not have a way to retreat. Otherwise, Matt has got this one wrapped up. So let's see what's in Brady's hand. Does he have the route? Goes for charge up, got the heat factory, so anything could happen because he gets to draw three more cards. Does he find a Guzma? See, Blacephalon, B-String, B-String's a dead card right now. Really tough. I don't think he's got the Guzma. If he did, he might just play it. I know that Brady probably sees the play, knows that that is his only way out, but just a real grinder of a spot. He can't promote any GXs. He could promote a second Blacephalon. So I think he's already attached to his bench Blacephalon. That would have been ideal if he could have attached to a fresh Blacephalon. He's got the Guzma, he sees the play. I think if Brady had just waited to attach the fire energy to the clean Blacephalon, he could have potentially ran away with this game. Uh, but I don't think that Matt has it. So Brady gets to accelerate with that. Matt might be stuck here. That, he's got Lily, but he needs an energy or an escape board or a Tate and Liza, something. He doesn't have it. He's not, you know, he would have played it already if he had it. He's got a Lily for a few cards. An energy or an escape board will win Matt the game. He'll be able to retreat and take his final knockout on that Placephalon GX. If he doesn't get it, then Brady is going to steal this game right out from underneath Matt. Matt was in the driver's seat the entire time. It's crazy to think that he might be out of this one. We are seeing potentially a Lily for four. So Matt gets to draw four cards. One, two, three, and four. Oh my gosh, he doesn't have it. Oh, this is unbelievable. He's got counter catcher. He could bring up the Tapu Lele, but as long as Brady's got an energy, that's it. So this is really a heartbreaker for Matt. Put that second counter energy down preemptively. He didn't even need to do that. He could have kept the counter energy in his hand. So this is really, really tough. Matt is checking the counts. He's looking at the energy. This is unbelievable. I can't believe that Brady was able to stick him here. Matt has so many switch outs in his deck, but it was a critical, oh, critical attachment there. Putting that counter energy down on the second Passimian. If Matt had just gripped that for one more turn, he could have come away on top. But I think that Matt has not got a way out of this one. It's just going to be Brady running away with the game. He could counter catcher. That's all he could do. He's got a counter catcher, the Lele. I just hope that Brady doesn't have an energy. But you know that Brady has an energy. That deck is a quarter energy. Blacephalon is just almost entirely energy. That's the entire deck. It's just energy and Blacephalons. That's it. So the counter catcher has got to happen. But... Oh, what a painful draw there for Matt. We just saw him draw card after card. They were all supporter cards. What a terrible whiff. 
unreal. And Blacephalon just proving that it is the deck that can be anything. Brady has got to know that Matt does not have it with that counter catcher. He passes. Brady, does he have the energy? Drops it. Oh, it retreats. And that is game unreal. Matt just got sacked so hard. I can't believe it. Brady comes away with the win there. Unbelievable game. We have had two insane games there back to back. Brady moving on to 2 0 here at the Wednesday Shop Tournament night here at Full Grip Games. Insane stuff from Brady. I can't believe he won that one. I was just so sure that he was out. I was sure he was out. I just knew that Passimian was going to trade favorably there, and it just, I can't believe the shake and bake play worked. That was nuts, nuts stuff. So uh, the shake and bake play there for the final two prizes. Guzman up the the Passimian that couldn't retreat and just got him there with the burst GX and the uh, mind blown for game. So Brady did play that perfectly. He really did. I liked everything that Brady did there, uh, except for just at the end, he could have saved the energy attachment instead of attaching to the damaged one. He could have attached to the clean one that he ended up getting off of the heat factory and then uh, could have promoted a clean Blacephalon there for his final turn, which would have made things even harder for Matt, would have forced Matt to have to have a Guzma for game in order to win. So that is an unfortunate part about kind of saving your uh, knockouts for later there. As Matt saw, he had to play from behind in order to get the most out of his counter energies. And then when things finally came down to it, uh, Matt just didn't have the switch card to get that card out of the active position. So super cool stuff. We got three rounds, Hint of Flame, gonna, uh, Hint of Lime. Going to be a three-round tournament here tonight. Just eight players, a lot of players out traveling for the holidays this week. So we've got one more round to go to see who is going to be our winner. Still $40 of store credit on the line for these guys here at Full Grip Games. So the potential to walk away with something pretty nice if you win. Uh, and Will Mantha, where are you tonight, my man? Where are you at? You could be here playing as well. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Millennial 3. Yes, the Thrasher hat is gone. I've got the Huff hat now is uh, back from the uh, kind of the abyss of Natalie's car. Uh, it was tucked away in Natalie's car, kind of like hidden behind a seat, just lost for a while. I lost... Uh, Lost the Thrasher hat, unfortunately, at Disney. Lost it on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. I was not expecting the Pirates of the Caribbean ride to go quickly at all. I was kind of just cruising, you know, with the hat on, and it just blew off, and it was gone, and it was just in the water, and there was no getting it. It was just complete goner. So caught me by surprise there. The, uh, the ride picked up speed a little bit quicker than I had anticipated. And the Thrasher hat, you know, RIP to the Thrasher hat. It had a good run. It was a good hat. Liked the hat, but, you know, hats, hats, you know, they, they come and they go. That's the way that it is with hats. So hopefully, let's see, Sean comes in here and lets me know who we have on our feature match here for the final round. Uh, I don't recognize these players' shirts, so I do need... Sean to come in and let me know though. I am super stoked that Natalie helped me out with these uh, OBS overlays you guys will notice this is probably much less awkward Now that I'm editing the OB OBS overlays just so easy. I also have their records up. So that's super nice Who do we got Sean? I got Brady in the same exact spot. Ah, excellent. Yes and then, um, Andrew Barlow that was an insane game, Sean. That was so crazy. Was it good? Oh, my gosh. Brady just got him. He got him. He stalled him out for game. It was nuts. Oh, that's pretty good. Ooh, where did this guy come from, Sean? He exists in the store right Look now. Look at him. See a fella that you might want to send away to the uh, – Professional sports grading service? Should I? That's kind of my question. That's yeah. why I brought him in here. Yeah. So Sean and I have been sending things away to PSA. This Blastoise is looking awfully crispy. Uh, these unlimited Blastoises can be 
very good if they grade tens. So I think you give it a shot. Yeah. Is that so? I don't own it yet. Should I pursue it? Oh, should you buy it? Uh, yeah. well, you know, well, what if I want to buy it? You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you whose it is. You know, after the. Oh, the stream, I thought the store owned it. No, no, no. Oh. I need to know how aggressively I need to bid on it. Oh, oh, well. Game, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So cool. So yeah, we could talk PSA. We could talk that afterwards. That is a nice looking Blastoise, yeah. though. Tell you what, that uh, that's probably someone you want to send away. It's probably like a, a it's high a nine. nine. Yeah. I think it is a nine. It is just super crisp looking though. So. But if it was a ten, ooh. I know if it's a ten, that's just a money card. All right, these guys are getting ready to go. Uh, who's on the left again? Uh, Andrew Barlow. Andrew I, the computer yeah. How do I spell that? Andrew Barlow. Got it. Good ooh. to go. Thank you. Uh, let's see, player one, properties, Andrew Barlow. Here we go. Alrighty then, on to our final round at the Full Grip Games Shop Tournament. Got Brady starting off with a mulligan. Gonna switch over real quick, but I do need to uh, edit the overlay. The overlay is almost done. Here it goes. All right. Quickly, quickly, quickly. They are getting going here. Both players 2-0 competing for top honors and some store credit at the Full Grip Games Shop Tournament. I uh, have no idea what Andrew Barlow's playing, so that should be interesting to see what he was able to take to 2-0 here. Brady also 2-0 with his Blacephalon deck. Busted Blacephalon, that deck that just never stops. It wins games it shouldn't win. Comes out of nowhere, blindsiding things. Had no business winning that game against Matt Price's Basimian last game. No business doing it, but was able to pull it off anyways, just because Blacephalon is so strong, just be like that sometimes. Able to take advantage of any ounce or sliver of inconsistency in your opponent's deck or game plan. Blacephalon just capitalizes. I can't believe Brady was able to win. Even with that turn that he sacked, the Marshadow went behind. Uh, but was able to march his way right on back. I mean, he played that game very well. He benched Blacephalons later in the game, not early. I really liked his game plan there, getting set up. So definitely did exactly what he needed to to be able to capitalize. I do see a Professor Elms lecture in Andrew Barlow's hand, so he's going to be able to start off strong here, searching out some basic Pokemon uh, definitely love starting hands with Professor Elm's lecture in them. Awesome stuff. Brady mulliganed and has found a basic. So looks like Andrew Barlow is going to take his mulligans. Andrew Barlow is playing a Decidueye deck. So awesome stuff here. We'll get to see Decidueye versus Brady's Blacephalon. And it looks like Brady is on the draw first. That's a big deal. Going first against Decidueye is fantastic. Really good stuff stuff there for Brady. And Brady also starting the Blacephalon is great, though Andrew starting with the Alolan Vulpix means that he might be able to just punish Brady early with that Alolan Ninetales GX. We do need to be on the lookout for that. So I know that Brady, or Andrew does have the Professor Elms Lecture in his hand. He will be able to play that, but if he has a backup supporter, that's what we really want to know. Does Andrew Barlow have backup draw option after the initial lecture here? He can go in for the beacon though, so that will be good. He probably will end up using beacon for Alolan Ninetales GX, maybe a Tapu Lele, and will be able to establish his board position from there. Brady going in early with the discard of the Fire Energy with Mysterious Treasure, getting himself a Poiple, establishing his board. Nice. And the turn one Beast Energy again. Ultra Balling away, Guzma and Fire Energy. We have to think that he's going for a Tapu Lele right here. And I want, to, oh, he doesn't. Okay, he's got one card left in hand. That's probably a supporter. There we go, Cynthia. Okay, didn't see that final card left in hand. So the turn one, Cynthia, playing his hand down perfectly. And he'll get six 
brand new cards here off of that Cynthia draw. So great turn one so far from Brady. I think there's almost nothing else that he really needs to see. Ideally, he wants to see one more Poiple. I did play against this mashup quite a bit myself. I played against it twice at the last League Cup that I played in and found that it can be bad for Blacephalon if you play it wrong. If you bench multiple Blacephalon GX, then uh, the Decidueye deck can play around your uh, play around your B string turns completely by taking a four prize turn by knocking out both Blacephalon in the same turn. You really got to look out for that. So if Brady knows what he's doing he's going to withhold playing down to Blacephalon GX until that first one goes down you want to make them knock out that first Blacephalon GX then put down Blacephalons and play your B strings that is the way to go Thank you, Will, for the bits. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys, everybody, for hanging out here in the chat tonight. Thank you all for checking out the stream. Appreciate it. Appreciate the love and support, y'all. Uh, we got our Discord set up for all our Twitch subs as well. So that has been a blast as well. Already got all our Patreon people in there. Now we're going to be adding the Discord uh, or the Twitch people. So we got the Twitch and the Patreon subs all in the same Discord chat. Awesome stuff stuff there and of course we got you know riley and natalie and all the gang in that discord chat as well uh do lots of deck discussion and all of that in there thank you torturer of souls for the bit appreciate it all right so andrew barlow uh has got his three pokemon is rua a Rowlet, and an alola nine tails off of the professor elms lecture going to bench those just the one rallet i'd love to see another rallet i remember last time i saw andrew play i think he wasn't able to get hardly any decidueyes out so hopefully we get to see more decidueyes this game than last see the rainbow energy go down to the benched vulpix there and then i have to imagine we're just going to see a beacon from andrew barlow he's got his deck turned sideways yep gestures to the beacon gonna go in and just grab two pokemon from his deck amazing setup card here with the alolan vulpix just such an incredible card able to set up so many decks and we do see both the alolan nine tails gx and tapu lele gx off of that beacon so that andrew can hopefully have a pretty explosive turn two here so uh great start from andrew as well hopefully he's able to utilize that alone nine tails gx to get a turn two decidui that being said he probably is also going to want to go in with the uh the counter energy to or the counter gain to knock out that active placephalon there with his gx attack Two Naganadels coming straight down from Brady's hand. Got a very powerful turn two set up here. This is everything he wants. Now, Brady's kind of in this classic scenario that you find yourself in in this matchup. Do I actually knock out the Vulpix or do I just burst GX? And I tend to say you knock out the Vulpix here. Uh, he will only have to loss zone one fire since he does have the beast. I really like that. And knocking out the Vulpix just kind of weakens Andrew's board position. It makes it so that he doesn't have as many Vulp nine tails options in, uh, in his deck. Though he does have that Vulpix there on his bench. Thank you, Nebula9, for the bits. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And Paul Samanko, thank y'all very much for the donations and for the support. Y'all rock. Appreciate it very much. So Brady getting the Sightseer into the Heat Factory. Going to draw a ton of cards here. He's got the second Blacephalon on his bench, which is a little bit dangerous. As I've said, uh, if played correctly, the Decidueye deck can take four prizes in one turn. Uh, against a board setup like this. If Andrew Barlow decided he wanted to go in and swing in with a um, swing in with a Zorark. The way to do this is you actually promote the Zerua and you swing into that active Blacephalon with a Zorark this turn and then you Guzma or Countercatcher or whatever and then kind of Decidueye snipe the the hit Blacephalon and knock out a Blacephalon with Alolan Ninetales' GX in one turn. That's the only way to make that play happen though it is a game winning play. You set up that four prize turn, it's just a game winning play. There's really no other way to 
for Blissefflon to come back from that, especially after all their energy has been wiped out of play and their beast ring option has been taken away. But we do see Andrew Barlow will gladly go in here and take those two prizes with Alolan Ninetales GX and that GX attack utilizing the counter gain that he's getting off of the ability here as well as that rare candy. So we know that Andrew Barlow will be able to rare candy into Decidueye as well and get a pretty formidable start up here for himself. But Brady does have a fire energy on his bench, Blacephalon, meaning that he will likely be able to punish this nine tails instantly and since brady has not actually used his burst gx attack yet either even if brady does find himself on the back foot he'll be able to clean up and go back to even prizes with a blacephalon gx going forward with that burst gx i really want to see another rowlet come down from andrew he's got the double colorless energy on a zerua he can evolve both the ditto and the Zerua into Zoroarks, that's fine, but I want to see at least two Decidueye. Without two Decidueye in play, you're not really doing enough snipe, snipe damage in order to make the whole Decidueye thing worth it. Really, one Decidueye is not quite enough. You need two. So we've got to see at least probably a Zoroark first. I'd like to see a Zoroark so that Andrew can establish his board. And then I'd like to see a Rowlet come down. I think I do see a Zoroark there. He gestures it to the front. Probably going to slam that right down on the double colorless. Yes, very good. And trade. See Field Blower and Elms Lecture. So we might have to wait until next turn to get that other Rowlet down. Don't forget the Feather Arrow. Uh, I always forget to Feather Arrow, so hopefully Andrew remembers here. Yep, going to Feather Arrow onto that Bench Blacephalon GX. Soften that thing up since he's going in for the Sublimation GX here to take his two prizes and the lead. Though Brady is hardly concerned because he has just unlocked his Beast Ring turn. So Brady can kind of just go and have himself a little Beast Ring party here if he has them available to him. Brady benches his fourth Poipal. So that answers the question. Brady has gone to a thicker Poipal line here, and I really do like that. I, I personally love a 4-4 Naganata line. Really good for those non-GX matchups for Blacephalon. So great to see Brady kind of adopt that strategy as well. Then it looks like he just has to Cynthia. So he will save his Heat Factory until after the Cynthia. I like that. Kind of draw six new cards first. Assume you'll probably see a fire energy off of the Cynthia in order to Heat Factory for more cards. But since that hand didn't have any cards that Brady really wanted to see, I don't really think that he should have, uh, you know, Heat Factory before the Cynthia. I think Heat Factory after the Cynthia is probably ideal. So he shuffles up here, gonna draw six new cards. And let's see what we got here on Brady's side. Do we got a beast ring? He doesn't need a beast ring to take the knockout, but he does need a beast ring in order to kind of keep tempo with Andrew Barlow. And I think I saw one. Let's see. Um, kind of like leaning as if like leaning uh, here in the studio could actually help me see Brady's hand. But I am very interested to see what he has. He's got a big secret rare B-string there. Yes, I know. I sold him at least one of those B-strings last week. So that is pretty sweet to see it in action there on stream. Uh, nice blinged out B-string there. Beautiful. And thank you so much, senior poker player for the bits. Shout out to you for being awesome. Brady's going to go in with that B-string, grab two energy from the deck, probably slap them onto a Naganado. It doesn't really matter where they come from. Just look into, uh, you know, get them onto the board so that he can mind blow them away. I think ideally he wants to get another Blacephalon out this turn. Uh, though if he does... Yes, he definitely wants to get another Blacephalon out. I think that would have been the ideal scenario would have been to be string to a second Blacephalon, but he doesn't exactly have that out. It doesn't actually matter, though. Since Brady does play Energy Switch in his deck, it you he can easily just be string onto an Agonade out, then Energy Switch those off later. Doesn't matter at all. So Brady will get another Naganado, I imagine, and slap that into play. I think he had one of these Poibles down last turn. 
No, just going for the Marshadow wants to limit Andrew this turn. So digging a little bit further here. I love the Marshadow here. Awesome stuff. Drawing more cards before he takes a big two prizes to go down to three prizes himself. Brady is missing another Blissephalon, though. Definitely wants to find one of those. So hopefully he finds one off of this Let Loose. I think so long as he's got one in hand, then he should be good to go for next turn. I think he needs to see a Blacephalon and an energy switch so that he can energy switch off of some of these Naganadels next turn and go forward to knock out this Zoroark GX. I think that Brady has probably cut the choice bands from his list. That's what it's looking like. I don't remember seeing any choice bands in Brady's list last game. I personally am not playing any choice bands in my Blacephalon list either. So it looks like just straight consistency, and I love that. I do really want to know if Brady's got a supporter in his hand, though. He does get to take two prizes, so he might get a supporter off of these prizes to draw him more cards. Can't quite see what he's got there, but his board is absolutely stellar as he goes for this gigantic mind blown. Think I see a Cynthia there in his hand, so he is safe. He's gonna save one fire energy on the active Blacephalon. I think I would just sack that fire on the active Blacephalon. You know that thing is not living this turn. Uh, Andrew could definitely trade and then get a Decidui, you know, Decidui snipe. So I think, you know, that Blacephalon is probably not living, but it's fair to say that it it might. Uh, I think, you know, he did let loose him to four cards. Thank you, Gross Meta, for the bits. Appreciate it. So uh, he's just going to go in with the trade here. Doesn't have a draw supporter, it looks like. He's got the Elms Lecture. That's not what he wants to see. Well, it is. If he has a choice band in hand, then that will be a knockout. He'll be able to do uh, a perfect uh, 150 damage uh, with the uh, with the Feather Arrow as well. Do 170 with the 20 there. He would take the knockout on that Blacephalon. But if he's 20 damage shy, yes, he can clean that up next turn with a Feather Arrow, but that gives Brady another turn of Beast Ring. And with Brady having one more turn of Beast Ring, that could just be complete devastation for Andrew Barlow, giving Brady just another turn to turn through his deck. He's still got that Heat Factory Stadium there, so going to be able to draw more cards as well, more opportunities to see Beast Ring. Uh, if Andrew doesn't take this knockout here, he is going uh, just with a one-way ticket to Punish Town. There is going to be no retribution here for Andrew if he doesn't take this knockout. I think he needs the choice ban right now. If he has an Alolan Ninetales in his deck, he could go get it, but I take it by the shuffle that he has not got it like that. He's just got the two Rallets, which, yes, he's got Rare Candy Decidueye. He's got the Choice Band, actually, so he does have the Knockout. Great stuff here from Andrew. Didn't see that Choice Band, so this is phenomenal. He's got the Knockout on Brady's side, and the ball is going to be back in Brady's court. Going to see if he can do it. Got the big knockout. Two prizes remaining for Andrew Barlow. Got Rare Candy Decidueye in hand. In a commanding position here with that Zorark GX active, Brady needs to Lost Zone five fire energies to take care of this thing. This is a turn we need Blacephalon energy switch. That is just what we need. We've got a fire energy here. Does he have energy switch or a supporter at least to go help him get? He's got the energy switch already. Insane. He's got it in hand. Didn't even need to go for it. He doesn't even need a supporter. He doesn't even need the heat factory. He's just got it all right here. This thing is going down. He's got triple charge up. Uh, does he have any fires in the discard pile? Actually, he's got, yes, two fires for charge up. All Brady is going to need to do is just use his GX attack for game. He can also heat factory to draw more cards. Love it. Brady's just got it all in his hand. Clowns just absolutely insane. Andrew responded to the knockout with everything he needed. Responded under a let loose scenario and Brady has just got the flames, got the juice in his hand, no questions asked. Didn't even need to go look for it. He's just got it all 
right there. So insane stuff here for Brady. Brady just responding anytime he's asked today. He has got the answer. So awesome stuff here out of Brady showing off this incredible Blacephalon deck. Uh, super consistent. I'm loving the list that Brady has got going on over here. It's uh, looking like uh, pretty similar to the list that I was playing at the League Cup. I'm liking it a lot. I know he plays Sightseer. He really likes Sightseer. I'm not the biggest Sightseer fan, but Brady is a big Sightseer fan. So I think he's pretty much just playing the Sightseer instead of the Sophocles. And really that card is kind of like to each their own. You like Sightseer, go for Sightseer. You like Sophocles, go for Sophocles. Whichever supporter you like that discards fire energy, you know, go ahead and ship it. So Brady is going to Lost Zone, his five fire energy here. Take a huge knockout on this Zorark GX uh, and leave himself with just one prize remaining. Andrew Barlow uh, could win the game. I mean, Andrew can win the game this turn. It's possible. Andrew would need a Zorark GX, another choice band, and another Decidueye. He needs a lot. He's got the Rescue Stretcher, so he's got the Zorark. The Zorark is coming back. And he's got the Rare Candy Decidueye in his hand as well. I know he's got that. So right now he's at 160 damage. He'll trade away. He's got Guzma and Ultra Ball. So he could potentially go get a Tapu Lele and get himself another Supporter if he has another Tapu Lele in deck, but he might not. So he might just be stuck here, kind of stalled stalled out against Brady. See him shuffling his hand around. He's not immediately gesturing for his deck. Really tough spot here for Andrew. He's got the counter catcher. The counter catcher is a thing he could do, but it's not really a good thing, really. Uh, as long as Brady's got an energy, he's going to be able to get out of this one. But I think the counter catcher, the Marsh Shadow, that's just the moment of desperation. It means that he doesn't really have anything else to go for. He's got an Ultra Ball here, but what is he getting with the Ultra Ball? I think if he's got a Tapu Lele, then, you know, he probably should have just laylayed here. Uh, why bring up the Marsh Shadow? That is interesting. I think, and he'll judge Brady. Okay, so I think maybe Andrew knows that he doesn't have a choice ban left in deck, but even then you could get the third Decidueye in, uh, into play here if you go for a Cynthia or something like that, and you could just knock out that Blacephalon. If you hit Rare Candy, Decidueye, and a Double Colorless, you get the Triple Feather Arrow and the 120 damage, knock out the Blacephalon for game. I think there's no way that we're not gonna see a Fire Energy or an Energy Switch from Brady here off of these five cards that he gets off of a Judge to four, and of course his top deck for turn. So an interesting line of play from Andrew Barlow here, uh, definitely in the grinder with only four cards himself and no trades. That means that these are just the four cards that he is stuck with with nowhere else to go. So this could just be a tough one for Andrew. I mean, he does get to kind of maybe say, if he doesn't have the fire, I'll double feather arrow, maybe something on the bench, and then hopefully take knockout next turn for game. But I think uh, if you're Andrew, you have to go for the aggressive play there. You just have to hope that you draw into everything you need and just take the uh, take the Blacephalon for game. Uh, I think that there are just so many fire energies in Brady's deck that he'll probably just end up seeing one. But that's just uh, that's just my kind of my you know vision here. He can't really afford to take this knockout. Uh, so he has to just Feather Arrow twice and pass. He did get the Double Colorless on the Zorark, but Brady's got Guzma for game, so that's it. Brady's going to go to 3-0, win, uh, win the Wednesday Shop Tournament here at Full Grip Games. Amaz amazing display there from both players. Uh, really powerful Decidueye deck there, taking some critical knockouts on Brady's Pokemon. But again, Blacephalon just showing it is the deck to beat here at Full Grip Games. Crazy deck, super, super consistent. Brady's been playing it for weeks, so he pilots it really, really well. Shout out to Brady for going 3-0 undefeated at this Wednesday night shop tournament here at Full Grip Games. Gonna see if maybe we can bring him back and talk about the deck a little bit, talk about some changes that he has made to his list. I know I played him at the League Cup a couple weeks ago, and 
and I think that I might have seen some different things in his list. Definitely a thicker Naganeda line. I think we're both on that line of play. Super, super consistent deck. Just as long as it sets up, it wins games. Can absolutely just thrash your opponent. Almost never misses a beat. So that is Blacephalon for you. Awesome stuff there. And just great play all around. Matt showing off that Passimian deck as well. I'm going to be showing off Passimian on Mahone's Tricky Gym on YouTube. So if you are into Passimian, maybe we'll show it off tonight. Maybe a stream, a couple games of PTCGO here. Uh, we've got quite a few of you guys in the chat, so that would be pretty rocking. I could see moving on to some Passimian. If I can get Matt Price back here to kind of show me the ropes on a Passimian deck, I think we could also potentially pull up, uh, I guess I could pull up Limitless TCG and see what these... Uh, see what these lists are looking like for Passimian. That could be a lot of fun as well. But I do want to get a gameplay up with Passimian in standard format. I haven't shown that off yet. So definitely stoked to do that and excited that there is kind of a newcomer here in standard format. Let's see. We got Sean. Let's see if Sean hears me. Sean, bring back Brady. <laughs> bring Brady back. Right, okay, excellent. Brady is a coming. What you got there in your hand, Sean? Uh, you hot got dollar. a hot single dollar. All Brady's right. Brady, yes, you are quite the full grip games champion, Brady. Uh, so I noticed, first of all, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yes, let's see. Get you on camera. Very good. First of all, congrats on another win here. You are quite the uh, tournament champion, so <laughs> you're going to enjoy that store credit. Yep. Saw some changes to your Blacephalon list, I think. So yeah. why don't you run me through some of the changes you made and why you made them? I made three changes. I cut both choice bands for an extra Ploy Paul and the Ganondale. Really like that? Uh, yeah, because at the cup I played last weekend, Every game I prized a Ploypole, every single one. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, okay, well, we're going to add some Ploypoles. <laughs> right. Um, and then I cut uh, Sightseer for a fourth Mysterious Treasure. Okay, and cool. I just liked having uh, like more ways to discard without having to play the supporter. Right, so you're a four Mysterious Treasure, four Ultra Ball, right. super consistent, yep. four, four, nine, eight line. I love that, and it paid off in your game versus Matt. Yeah, I mean, we just saw there. I wasn't sure in that game. I was like, I don't know if he's just at a three-three Naganade line. If he's at the three-three, <laughs> this is going to be a little bit of a grinder yeah, for him. Right. But when I saw you bench the fourth Poipel, I was like, there you go, Brady. Awesome <laughs> stuff, man. Yeah, got the whole squad out. So first of all, I want to talk to you about that game with Matt Price. Crazy game. Yeah. <laughs> that was nuts. I was here, like, losing my mind. I was like, okay, I, I counted Brady out of that game, like, a long time ago. <laughs> but then you were able to march that one back. So talk to me about kind of what was going through your mind, how you decided to set up your board against that Passimian deck there. Uh, well, I started out not wanting to play any GXs. Right. I just wanted to be able to, like, goose them up Passimians and kill them with Naganadels. Right. Um, but then I whiffed energy, so I had to get Lele, and then I whiffed energy again. Yes. <laughs> so I just had to pass. Um, but then I was able to, uh, I was able to Guzma up a Passimian the next turn, I think. But then he knocked out something with, he, he knocked out the Marshadow, and then he knocked out uh, another Naganadel with yeah. the Ranguru. Yes. And then I got the, the Ranguru was a huge problem. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> Brady loses. Like, the yeah. Ranguru is too much, guys. Yeah. You know, the Ranguru took like three prizes. Right. I was like, there's no actual way Brady wins this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. And then I just, I knew that, like, at the end, I knew the only way I could win is gives them up the one thing that can't free retreat. The shake and bake. Yeah. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I was like, I hope Brady sees the play because that's yeah. like, that's his only out right. is to yeah. Guzma that thing yeah. and then burst and just hope he ain't got it. Yeah. Sure enough, Matt was like drawing off his lily <laughs> one by one. Yeah. It was just supporter card, supporter card, supporter <laughs> card, supporter card, <laughs> nothing. It just didn't have it. And Matt actually attached, he double attached, he, well not double attached, but he attached that uh, counter energy even though he didn't have to. He could have just oh, held on to it. other Passimians? Yeah, yeah right. he could have just gripped it, man. Yeah. <laughs> he just gripped it, then yeah. it would have been in. But uh, yeah. I guess he you know, he wasn't scared to let loose. He could have just, he knows you only play the let loose. Mm -hmm. There's no real reason to put that down. Yeah. So it's um, just a tough call there. And then there was there. that Sightseer. That Sightseer did a five energy. <laughs> that was yes. so tough. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So some really heads up play there against Passimian. And then against uh, Andrew Barlow's uh, Decidueye deck, how do you feel against Decidueye in general there? Um, 
I played against it at the like League Cup. I played against last. I played out last weekend in top four and yeah. lost because I had no clue what to do. You made it to top four last weekend. Yeah. Hey, good <laughs> stuff, man. <laughs> hey, good stuff. Congrats. Um, because the the person I played against last weekend skipped, uh, B string. Okay. Yes. Did they take the double knockouts on your blue yeah. ones? Uh, the first game he, like, uh, feather arrowed um, yeah. out like a poi pole, uh-huh. and then he got a blue on and a Gandel in the same oh, turn. Oh my god! But the second game, the second game he didn't get a Sidgwai out, and he just kept uh, nine tails like seventy thirtying, and then oh eventually took out two blue <laughs> on the same turn. <laughs> That's bad. Yeah, and I was wasn't drawing any energy at all. Okay. So I was not like super confident about that matchup based okay. on those two results. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, but. Uh, it worked today because well he's sublimationed and like that's like good for me. That's great for you. B string. Yes, that's yeah. what I was saying. I was <laughs> yeah. like Andrew could take control of this matchup if he keeps Brady off of B string. Yeah. And then he went in for the sublimation. And I was like, oh Brady's fine. Brady, yeah, yeah, that's gonna be good. But he kind of I kind of needed to because I had like such a good setup. I had like I already had two again yeah. out and another poi pole. So he kind of needed to respond because I would have been able to knock out the quickly. nine tails. Yeah. Yes, it was going to escalate quickly if he didn't. So, yeah. I was thinking like maybe the play is when you're deciduous to go in with a Zoroark first, hit maybe. a Blacephalon for 150, right? Then try to like counter catch your sublimation yeah. and double Feather Arrow. Four prizes in one turn. That's yeah. like the dream right. setup. <laughs> that, like that's what you want, but it's harder to do in True. reality. Yeah. And Zorark takes an extra energy discard, so that would have been exactly Zorark is like the the lead who you yeah. want to go in with. But there's a lot of times just that sublimation is so tasty. You just <laughs> right. just want it. It's like I got the counter, and, you know, I got the so uh, awesome stuff there, Brady. Congrats Thank again you. on another Thanks. win, man, and uh, enjoy that store credit. Thank you. Yeah, so another awesome win for Blacephalon. Thank you to Brady for sharing us the insight on your list and those changes that you made. Awesome stuff there.